Have you ever been in a bad partnership? Do you want to know what to do to be able to actually not get into another bad partnership? Well, it's, it's a lot to do with doing your due diligence on that human being, to understanding, doing background checks. And there's special ways that you can do that to protect yourself when you're getting into a partnership. My friend, uh, Jeff Baker and Chris Burr, had come to the lunch club and shared an amazing presentation and exactly how to do this and how to protect yourself. Without further ado, here's Chris and Jeff. Awesome. Hello, guys. I'm Jeff Baker. This is Chris Burr. I don't know how we're going to follow that, but <laughs> you can start mine now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ended up in law school, but I was bad at acting. <laughs> I also got a business card binder here that has both Chris and I's card in it. Um, I'll pass around. You can take the cards and put yours in there. We will be doing it. We'll pull a card out of here and we'll give somebody a one hour phone consultation. What are your, your phone numbers? They'll be on the cards too. Okay, great. Yeah, and they're also at the end, slide. end of the end slide, they're on there too. Um, so, yeah, we'll be doing a one hour consultation for somebody that wants to kind of get started in due diligence. You want to bring a new deal or a new partnership or something to us, we can start walking through those steps. and. So that's what we'll give away uh, for your, your uh, business card today. So I'll start with you here. Um, yeah, I'm Jeff Baker. Once again, I've, uh, I do some buy and hold, and I've done a lot of lending, um, and I've gotten burnt. I, I'm only about three years into real estate, but I've uh, been parts of lots of different businesses and startups. And uh, I got some money saved up and started getting, really wanted to get into real estate for a long time. I started getting into it and probably went a little too fast. I did what I thought was good due diligence, um, but uh, I failed. Um, that was, I will preface this up before I uh, started working with Chris. Chris is also my attorney, um, and all my business deals go through him no matter what, even if it's not real estate, they'll, they'll look at contracts. And uh, yeah, thank you, Jeff. My name is Chris Spur. I'm a business in real estate. Am I loud enough back there? I can't hear Okay. If I'm screaming, we need to switch to the mic. Just let me know. Um, my name is Chris Spur. I'm a business and real estate attorney. I'm licensed both here and in Michigan. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, so for the last year and a half, I've been running my own firm, Spur Law LLC. As of Thursday of next week, I'll be merging with another boutique firm uh, down in Centennial called Mass and Bertram. I met Jeff um, when he walked through my office and he told me what he did as far as due diligence. I said, wow, most clients do not do this level of due diligence, but it turns out it didn't matter. And what Adam Adams said couldn't be more true. If you've had good relationships with partners, you may have just been lucky. Dodge the bullet. Um, we're here to make sure that's not a product of luck, but more of the luck you create. Yeah, I would say if you use a system like this, you can take out 95% of that buck um, by catching some red flags early on in the process. So since you have an attorney in the room, you probably saw this coming. Uh, disclaimer, <laughs> contents of this presentation not to be interpreted as legal advice. If you need legal advice, feel free to contact one of us. We'll put us in good hands, whether my own, anyone else's, it's about the right fit, not us. So history, once again, I uh, was burned after doing some, some good due diligence that I thought I had done, probably um, what everybody has done in here, uh, on some people and some, some deals. Everybody here is do your due diligence, but what does that really mean? I mean, seriously, every single real estate group that I go to, they're like, do your due diligence. Now, there are a lot of real estate training and education programs that will teach you how to do due diligence on properties. You know, make sure you're checking foundation or you're getting a GC in there, you need a checklist when you're walking through properties, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You guys have kind of all heard that probably a million times, but everybody speaks about it, but no one really teaches how to do you know, people. Um, and nobody really knows. I, just, I think this goes across all businesses like this, with that. So, and, uh, last thing said, it takes multiple people, it takes a team. You've heard about build your real estate team. Uh, use your attorney. They should be a team. You should be collaborating together. You should be bouncing ideas off each other and working together to collect information and data to do the proper due diligence. Can I talk to you guys? Yep. 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 Okay. Uh, so yeah, that uh, there are multiple other people that you could bring in. Um, structural engineers, if you need that, environmental people. But there is a team that you need to have. It does start with the attorney, and the attorney will do a lot of the work 
But if you can provide a lot of the data for them to do some of the work, you will be saving money and it will be more of a team approach. That's good. This is off. Sorry. Oh, yep. Sorry. Yeah, too loud. I know it's going to get some crazy. Is it okay if I yell? Am I loud enough? Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, again, there's always different professionals you're going to need to pull in for different sorts of deals, you know, especially those of you in the commercial realm, uh, you know, want to, you know, look more at environmental. Um, if it's a particularly decrepit property, you're going to need a structural engineer. Due diligence is all about gathering enough data to later synthesize and draw a conclusion based on your own risk factor. So today we're going to be speaking mostly about the due diligence between the attorney and the investor. Um, that's not all encompassing, nor the topics we're going to speak on today. So for purpose of today, ensuring the, the de definition of our due diligence is ensuring the sufficiency and stability of the expected return generated from the prospective deal by gathering enough information to properly evaluate whether the deal will meet investment goals and comport with one's risk tolerance. And then you add in the human factor, and that's where everything gets screwed up. <laughs> so I wanted something visual, and a, a funnel concept came to my head. I wanted some type of filter system to be able to start dropping people through tiers. If you don't make it through the first tier, you stop and you walk away. If you make it through the first tier, then you continue to do your due diligence all the way through till you get to the end of the funnel and you spit out. Basically, the deal's good and the person's good, and if you don't have any red flags, then you can proceed with that. So we want it to be visual, and that's kind of where the funnel came from. So I already said this, but this deal that and some of these deals that I've done in the past that I got into trouble with was done before I was working with Chris. So he didn't help me with my legal advice, and then I got screwed. So this is a deal example: um, one, two, three, four, Spotswood Street, and I actually got ten references. I, for some reason, the standard seems to be three. Most people are like, oh yeah, can I get three references? I first off, way low references very low, and I think most people do because they're coming from the person you're trying to get information about. I got 10, I spoke to nine. There was no media warning signs. They all said the deal was great. I got the you know the return I was expected or better. It may have been a little bit longer, but most real estate deals tend to drag out a little bit. They told me very specifically, if you want to know that the granite countertops got installed today, you're not going to get that from this partner. He will update you. You can see the property, et cetera, et cetera. But, you're not going to get that level of detail. I was fine with it. That's why I wanted to be lending money as a passive investor because I didn't want to be looking at, at that kind of stuff. Um, I was convinced that I would be more secure in the deal if it ran through an operating agreement that owned the actual business, right? Owned the actual property, and I was an owner of the business. Um, deed of trust was going to be filed. I relied on them and trusted them to do that. They never did it. Um, I visited the property through the process. Looked great. Property listed. Property went under contract and sold, and I was not told about it, <laughs> nor was I paid. When I went back to the operating agreement, I went to the other partner that was on the deal and said, what's going on with this? And they may be a silent partner for the, for the whole entire project, and uh, they had never even heard of me. So basically, they had switched. There was some fraud involved in this. They had switched the signature page on the operating agreement that I had. So there was a lot of stuff that hopefully I had caught early on. And as I said, Jeff walked through my office having done pretty extensive due diligence for you know just an individual out there taking it upon themselves to do so. Um, and certain things in this presentation, you may be thinking to yourself, well, if I do this, I'm not going to partner with anyone. Anyone's going to be scared away. That is not true. Good partners out there with good business acumen are going to be expecting you to run like due diligence on themselves. So if they're that concerned about it, they're that spooked, if time is that of the essence, that may be a red flag in itself. So I posit to you that this should be a unilateral type inquiry on each side. So some of the lessons that I learned in that, I know Chris, uh, Adam had said that there were three mistakes that I learned. There was more than that. So um, I didn't dig deep enough. I didn't use an attorney. I had used attorneys before for previous deals. Um, the documentation that was presented to me looked good. Very similar. Um, I trusted the partners to do what they say, like filing the, the deed. Um, I had no efficient, locked and loaded tangible recourse uh, when this deal ended and to go back. Yes, I could file a lawsuit, but then I just get a judgment. Well, if it's a judgment against somebody that doesn't have any money, 
you're not going to get anything. The judgment's not going to do anything. So Chris will touch on that a little bit later. And I think initially, if you're a new investor, diversify amongst your partners. Either just do you want to be able to start, or diversify until you know that they're solid. I, I went in three deals with one, one group of people, and uh, it caused lots of problems. So if I had diversified, I probably would have done multiple deals with maybe seven people in here, because uh, my money hadn't been tied up still. So this is the funnel, and Chris is going to talk a lot about this uh, first section here. Um, yeah, click it one more time. I think we'll get some of those bullets up there. Yeah, there we go. Well, I'm going to explain the concept real. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so what we're thinking here is these first two categories. This is information gathering. Is it always going to matter that you looked into each one of these things? No. However. Once you get down to assessing your risk factors and your backup plans, and you painted a larger picture and you're able to look at something, um, you're able to zoom out and draw connections or places that aren't connecting when they should, that's when you all the kind of minute steps you take in the first two sections really kind of come to fruition and help you out. So some of the stuff we're going to go through, it might seem elementary, it could be, it also could not. So that's the kind of what we're trying to get you to think of. We're trying to get you to think of due diligence as not just what's going to happen in the past, but also in the forward, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, near future, and all the way to the end of the deal. That requires you having a pretty solid foundation on the entities involved, the people involved, uh, the parcel itself, since most of us are in the real estate game, but really these are transferable concepts you could use to investing in, you know, whatever it is you choose. So these are some of the initial things that most people in this room, I expect, given the experience level, would be able to do themselves. Um, that doesn't mean they should be glossed over because you can learn a lot that later, uh, that you would wish known at a later date. So first we're going to look at what's publicly available. Um, we're going to use my law firm as an example and we're going to run through this quickly, but for instance, everyone here knows how to do a business lookup on the Secretary of State website. Here you'll see my office and my office as, and myself as a registered agent matching my office address. Um, but what you are really concerned about is this link right here, filing history and documents. This gives you the history of the company. Now, these are my initial articles of organization. As you'll see, this is a rental property or a condominium of some sort. You're going to want to check on that. Why? Because you want to know whether that partner has skin in the game later. Again, I call it a hollow judgment. You can get a judgment against a piece of person. It's a piece of paper. That's great. But if they have nothing to lose, if they have no tangible assets, you just got a very expensive moral victory. <laughs> Um, this is one you will want to use an attorney for, or uh, let's say a paralegal, someone with access to the Colorado Courts e-filing system. Uh, search your prospective partner. Oh, and let me just backslide. When you look past those articles of organization and you look at all those filing history and documents, you're going to see other names crop up. Is the LLC you're dealing with a subsidiary of another LLC? You just expanded the scope of your due diligence. They're all for intents and purposes, people you want to run through this whole process with. So that's another reason to use those public records. Now that you've uh, you know, gathered your list of names, you're going to want to look at the Colorado Courts e-filing system. So I can look at current past proceedings for both individuals and entities. Uh, everything from money judgments, bankruptcies, um, traffic tickets, uh, divorce decrees what have you. Obviously all of those are not relevant to real estate investing. You know, typically a traffic violation does not speak to one's um, moral you know, compass. However, bankruptcies, money judgments, especially if pending against the current entity, do. Now that's not to say all of these are red flags and you shut the whole thing down. You know, bankruptcy six years ago when someone's honest about it and you know, maybe they have medical expenses, you know, life happens. That's fine if they're forthcoming. But this is what I like to give to my client and not tell the prospective partner, we already know it. And here's the real key, have my client ask them whether they've been involved in any of these past or current proceedings. There's your real reason to ask. If they're truthful and they're forthcoming, they say, yeah, you know, life got hard, I had a bankruptcy, that's one thing. If they already lie right there, you can stop this whole process, put the brakes on it, and look for your next deal. It is way more, 
It's way more intelligent to get involved, wait to get involved in the right deal than to jump into something just so you can scramble? say you're involved in the next cocktail hour you're at. Um, after that step, you're going to solicit all corporate documents and other relevant instruments they may have. Any inability or unwillingness to provide them is obviously a red flag unless they are, you know, if they, you know, they say I'm green, I'm new, I want to learn. All right, that's cool. We can, we can work with that. That's honest. Um, but then you're going to want to look to complete this as the contents and an exhaustive list of the types of documents necessary. If they're not giving you a deed of trust and they're asking you for money, they're missing documents. What do you do next? You read them. You don't just skip to where you see the percentage interest in the operating agreement. I know that's what everyone wants to know. What's my percentage in this? How much am I going to make? But you may find that the, the person who is approaching you doesn't even have um, authority in the operating agreement to uh, you know, borrow or later date um, convey title. I'm of the mind that if any entity is you know, unwilling to show you at least redacted financial statements and their capitalization, you need to really be looking closely at them and they need to have a good reason why. Um, I've seen it time and time again where someone is the money guy and the other one's the sweat equity guy and they're saying, you know, let's do it through my LLC, I need 400000 Well, maybe the purchase price of the property and the rehab was 400000 If they're not capitalized and there's nothing left in their accounts, you not only funded the deal, but you just capitalized their company. Unfortunately, that amount of capitalization equals the amount you're about to spend. So if things go south, there's nothing left in that LLC. And uh, especially if they don't have tangible assets and you can't pierce the corporate veil, you're out of luck on that one. Um, I'm going to get to this a little bit later, but this is a stage where you want to ask for affirmative statements in writing about the veracity of their representations. This preserves claims that later can pierce the corporate veil and can be your kind of insurance policy and saving grace throughout all of this. Um, continuing with the same theme, you know, what good is an unsecured promissory note from an undercapitalized entity? <laughs> cool, you can get a judgment against the entity, but there's nothing in the bank. It's dissolved, what have you. Uh, what good is a secured note if it's in the third position and the property is already underwater by virtue of the second? Um, if you're looking at a parcel loan, all these same principles apply. Um, search clerk and recorder and assessor's office, check for liens, ensure title lies with who um, they purport it does. <clears throat> we'll run through these because we're, we're kind of, you know, time-based we want some time for Q&A. Um, the, uh, you know, professional... You know, licensed professionals, they have your insurance policy as well. They have something to lose. They have a license publicly available. If they're a broker, you know, check Dora. If they're an attorney, check the Colorado Bar Association Complaints website. As a matter of fact, check that for every attorney you come across, whether you're planning to hire them or partner them. Um, Jeff's going to take away the rest here. Yeah, so a lot of this stuff is going to come from data that you have collected when speaking with this partner. So you're... This is kind of being done in tandem. He can start digging on, the, on all this background stuff that you can't get access to. And while you solicit references and start asking these questions to basically make sure that what they tell you is the same that he finds. Once again, if somebody told you they had a lawsuit, someone said, yeah, I had a bad business partner that sued me a couple of years ago, we settled or whatever the case would be, that's okay. If they tell you, no, I've never been in a lawsuit before, and you pull it up like one of the partners I was involved with, and they have the four or five, or five current uh, open lawsuits against them. So if I had done this step initially, I would not have done the deal. Um, so soliciting references, once again, they way very low. Consider how you met. Most people are being in groups like this, and then they're partnering very quickly. Um, you know, request your prior, like he said, prior or current deal documentation. And that, that's good because you can see exactly what's going on. And then you can also find out who that investor is that did or that deal with them, and you know that information. So when you're soliciting these references, you want to know what property, not just like they done deals. You want to know what property. I want the address of the property that you did. So you're going to ask, hopefully you get the deal information from your uh, potential partner, and then you're going to take that information when you start questioning the references. 
and make sure those line up. If it's, if it's different properties that they said they did, boom, red tag, walk away, they're lying again. Um, we go to the next one. What else do I got here? Uh, so we studied the previous deals. I uh, decided first impressions and how you know them. Do they know their numbers? Obviously, this is kind of simple, basic stuff. Um, analyze their budget. Get all the details of the deal. This is you saving money because the attorney could go get all these, this information, but you're going to pay him to do that. So save the money and get the get all this together as a team and then compare your notes. Obviously, you call those references. Once again, don't tell them the property. Ask them the specifics about the property, the address, and all that kind of stuff. Um, ask that potential party to go to a firm project. If it's in state and you can go see it, go see it. And then if you're there, and I, I wouldn't hide this. Um, like Chris talked about scaring away the potential partner. If somebody was legit and I took them to, or let's say I'm trying to do a deal, I take them to one of my projects, and they are starting asking the, con the, the subs, the contractors on site for you know, information about me. I can find that because I'm, I'm a straight shooter. I know that they're not going to say something, but if you start asking the trades, and like I said, do it right in front of them. Hey, you like to work with this guy? You know? Um, <laughs> And, and you know, maybe he'll say something after you go into another room or something, but it's it doesn't hurt. And it, it kind of just put that impression on your potential partner that you're not screwing around. You really, are, I'm going to dig into this deep. And and with that said, I tell every every person, every single business deal, whether you know, I just did a loan on medical equipment. I I told him right from the beginning, every bit of this is going through my attorney. And okay, so right from the beginning, I'll even sometimes CC Chris. Because it's Chris, Chris, Chris at Spur Law. Chris at Spur Law. So it ends in law. So if that's CC on sign. there, my potential partner is going to be like, okay, you already got to already have the turn. And I'll let them know CC on there. So that was a little bit ramble on there. But. Yeah, and I ask a lot of clients to do that. You know, that's not something I charge for, but I like people to know I'm involved in the beginning. If you have an attorney who is charging you for that, I'm not saying come to me, but you might want to shop around a little bit. <laughs> um, we already talked about that a little bit. We asked if they've been in a lawsuit, asked about bankruptcies, uh, previous LLCs, maybe that have gone bankrupt or closed or that are open still, uh, main names, aliases, any of the stuff that you can get to, to relate to that. Yeah, and um, this is obviously a side where the investor's acumen takes over. Uh, that said, if you have an attorney who is simply just putting documents in front of you saying yes, no, thumbs up, thumbs down, yeah not asking questions, not prodding a little bit, they may not be giving you their full attention and doing a great job. Part of my job is to make sure Jeff is asking the right questions. And as we discuss things, add stuff to his list. So this should be a dialogue. This isn't a, you go get your notes, I get mine, we come back. That happens, but we, there needs to be constant you know, communication, and that's also where, if you get nickel and dimed on that, there are better ways out there. Yeah, and creativity and strategy, that's really, you're strategizing with the partner, and your attorney should be your partner, they shouldn't be like, somebody that sees you at double hours. All right, so we've talked about, you know, your prospective partners, how about the um, empirical aspects of the parcel or the subject matter of the deal itself. We're still in those top two categories of information gathering. Um, evaluate different options with the property. You know, if Jeff comes to me and he says, hey, this is a single family home, but the lot looks like we can subdivide it, maybe throw a duplex on it, well, I need to be thinking zoning. Um, you know, cost related to allowed uses, is that built into the ARVs and the numbers that are presented thus far? Legal right of seller to convey, that goes back to the operating agreement, or you know, I'm using LLCs because it's the hot thing, but there's you know, corollaries to different entity structures. Um, I'm gonna get into a few more at the end, but I want Jeff to run through his part right here. So yeah, and uh, some of these things can be done together, and uh, physical site visit, know your comps, these are kind of basic stuff. Uh, structural evaluation. Um, and the HOA, I'm going to touch on this just a little bit because that's not thought about a lot. So when you're selling, if there's pending special assessments or anything going on, you you have legally have to let them know. You at least have to say check your the HOA docs. Um, so I uh, I can give you an example of a deal that I did. Went into a condo deal, it was supposed to be a quick flip. There was that my partner had already owned or did currently own two other units in the same building. 
So the crews were already there. They're using the same materials, all three units. They need to come in, it's to be six weeks, 697 square feet, easy. Um, I trusted that partner. They had done about 70 flips, and I've been a professional real estate investor for five years or so. And so I, I was kind of quick too. I just got back in town from a funeral. I got a call, hey, I need this money. It's going to be a good deal. It's going to be six weeks. Yes, I did it. I pulled the trigger. I came in with all the purchase and rehab money. Um, and I filmed check to HOA. We listed the property. All of a sudden, the property manager slapping these special assessment notices onto the, onto the apartment, giving them to potential buyers. There was a special assessment they started talking about in 2013. Um, within this HOA. It fell on and off the minutes over the years. So if you just checked recent, you may not get a set of minutes that was on. You need to check way, way back. The special assessment was, yeah, everyone heard this about special assessments, probably something that hit, and usually it's like $2,000, maybe up to $5,000, that would be big. This is a $35,000 special assessment for the smallest unit. So anybody that can afford a $200,000 condo in Denver is not going to buy when they see they're going to get slapped with a $35,000 special assessment. Plus, there was nothing in that that said this wasn't going to be a one-time thing. This is going to be a, we're going to take the loan to do the $3.2 million HVAC renovation that we need to do, and we'll take a loan and your monthly dues are going to increase by 50 bucks. That's not how it was presented. So after going back and forth with attorneys and with the HOA, getting them to remove that, special assessment because they don't even know if they can, they're going to do it. They kept saying, oh, we don't know. We've been talking about this for five, six years now. And so anyhow, that was kind of a hidden thing, and that, that burned me. We ended up selling the property uh, once they removed that, and we did get what we wanted for it. Didn't have to knock the $35,000 off the sales price, but that's what we were looking like we're going to have to do. So did everyone fully catch that? HOA fees are not of concern when you're looking at where my holding costs or what can we sell it for. It's very much a concern. Let's look to the past and see what ticking time bombs are in the future. Which is a good segue to another consideration, and that's what's happening in the legislature or in your you know, local municipality. I don't know if any of you have seen lately, it was in the Denver Post the other day, Denver's taking the initiative to go through and uh, more or less redo a bunch of sidewalks in central Denver. If you hold that property during that time when it's hit, that's gonna be built in. So you wanna be aware of what's going on in your community. If you're in an especially long-term deal, you commercial folks out there, you might want to see what's going on with the legislature in your area. Do you really want to put, um, you know, a large, maybe it's not the best example, but you know, let's say you're thinking, you know, we want to put in uh, something near, uh, let's see, I-70 that's going to be, you know, ADA and elderly friendly. And you didn't check to look at the fact that for the next 20 years, I-70 is going to be an absolute mess and everything around it. That's going to make your construction costs much higher because there's going to be different ingress and egress lanes. And it's going to be a lot harder to fill those units when there's this massive infrastructure project happening right next to it. So to be thinking about the past and the future, it's, it's not just one, one angle. Yeah, and that, that sidewalk thing is legit. So if you're looking at buying property into, in Denver right now, there's going to be 10 neighborhoods that are going to be done probably over the next 10 years. They are doing a bulk out on the concrete to get it lower for the homeowner, but the homeowner is still responsible. You're probably looking about 25 foot lot, three grand probably to replace the cement. So you can only be a half an inch difference. There can't be cracks. It has to be level. There's lots of stuff. City will never take responsibility for sidewalks. Homeowners always do. They just never really find anybody. 24% of Denver's doesn't have sidewalks. So that's a major ADA thing. They can get sued by ADA and, and whatnot. So that, that's coming. Uh, I'll, I'll keep talking because here. So Google Earth, if you're not going to the property, obviously Google Earth, and I'm sure that's something that everybody's told you. Have your attorney do it too, though. Because maybe there's something on, on there that he was talking about that you're not aware of, land use or some changes around there. Just being involved as a real estate attorney, they may know the area and be able to catch something. Um, talk to the neighbors and look at the school system. Obviously, these are pretty basic stuff that they teach you most uh, yeah. due diligence stuff. So. On this one, I mean, obviously most people know how to use Google Earth and other people would catch this too, but for instance, if I see that it's very close to a utility plant, I'm immediately thinking, are there utility easements on this property that we need to be concerned about that affect title? Or do they have rights um, that they can later exercise at a later date? Yeah, so 
Jeff will speak on you know the investor you know running the numbers and all that, which you guys are all in this room know better than I do. Uh, but what I do always ask is whether prospective partners are willing to uh, more or less sign off on what they're advertising. What are you basing your comps on? Are you objective? Is this your objective understanding of the deal? Do you believe in the veracity of your statements? Why? Because that preserves claims at a later date for fraud, negligent non-disclosure, misrepresentation. Those are important. Those pierce the veil no matter what state you're operating in. So that's your kind of last line of defense and insurance policy. And if they're out here advertising numbers and uses of the property, and they're afraid to put their signature next to it, is it, I mean, doesn't that speak for itself? We're not asking sign your life away, we're saying, do you believe this at this time? Things will change. You might find something later in the deal where it's like, okay, those are off. That's not what we're asking. We're asking, are you ready to make an affirmative statement that this is what you believe the facts to be at this moment in time. Could prove very useful later if the entity is dissolved, but that particular individual does have personal assets because they'll pierce the veil and you can preserve them by doing that itself. Yeah, so the, the other ones are, this is basic stuff, running your numbers, your options, talk to your broker, crime stats, and those are, we're not gonna go into detail. That's every real estate training and the courses teach that. So, you know, Chris, you're gonna play the easy, the attorney should play a little bit devil's advocate, um, but also be collaborating with you. Um, you know, if they see something bad, they should make you aware of it. Um, a lot of attorneys will try and stop a lot of deals without giving you an explanation. So, I don't like that style to say, I don't like it, don't do it. I want an explanation of why. So, um, you wanna have an attorney that will collaborate with you and give you some. And if I may, yeah, so. That whole don't do it no matter what, that's very rare that that's actually the case. Maybe once you've had a discussion with the client about their risk factors, what they're looking for out of the property, then you can make that determination. But we don't mean to be the buzzkill in the room. We truly don't. We get that these investments, they get momentum, you know, you get excited, you start getting 3D renditions, and you're like, oh, we can do this, this, and that. But if your attorney is not at least putting the bug in your ear to look at it from different angles, um, I feel as though they're doing you a disservice unless you really want them for documents alone and just to say you kind of ran through the motions rather than running through them well. Just a point I'd like to offer. So, yes. um, we, we've had it happen a number of times with clients, whether they're the primary client trying to do the deal or they're a partner that's trying to come into the deal and they're doing their due diligence on the property. Um, many times, either the investor themselves or more often than not the, the partner that's trying to come in on the deal doesn't have direct access to the MLS. And um, one, thing is that, one of the things that can happen is if you don't have direct access to the MLS, you can't see the additional documents that are attached to an MLS listing. And so you can look it up online through all the numerous portals that a regular person can have to look at a property, but you won't be able to see that. And you'd be really shocked to find some of the horrible notices that could be in those additional documents attached to the MLS listing. And just by virtue of not having direct MLS access, you may overlook that, um, and it could be a notice that it's a meth property. It could be a notice that it's got judgments against it from the city for previous growing activities. Uh, I mean, there's just there's unlimited numbers of bad things. Structure, sometimes there's whole things in there about a structural report review that was done that shows that there's many tens of thousands of dollars worth of structural damage, but it doesn't say anything about that in the rest of the MLS listing. Therefore, you may not be able to find it. So you need somebody that has that access in order to capture that as part of your due diligence. Excellent point. And as we said at the beginning, and that couldn't agree more, use all the different professional resources. You know, that is a perfect example. You can also tell a lot of the property's been under contract four times and it's been, you know, each time they back out there might be something up. So that's an excellent point. I'm going to add it to this slide if we end up doing it again. So, <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's good. And that comes in where your broker's not just giving you listings and they're actually working with you as part of your team. Catch, catch stuff. And sometimes it can be a prior history listing. Maybe it's not currently listed. You're getting an off-market deal, but you can still find this data from the previous listing. And it's just it's critical. No, you're absolutely right. It's out there. This information's out there. It just depends on how much you want to protect your investment. 
That's good, Alex. So risk factors, and you got to kind of determine what your own risk factor score is, whether you have a, a 1 to 10 or, you know, you're a super aggressive or you're more conservative. Um, it's probably the way that you live your life as well. If you like to jump out of planes and rock climbing, you're probably more.